Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Laura Hogan. For those who don't know me, I'm standing in for Emily Brown today. She can't be here. So I just want to introduce, this is our second to last colloquium event, um, Uncomfortable Conversations, a collaboration with Multicultural Affairs. Um, Rob Delalu will be talking about basically how much of our biases can, can sometimes create misinformation, which has been the theme throughout this whole colloquium. And we will have that starting in a few minutes. Our last colloquium will be taking place on April 11th. Um, and that is going to be about um, the hidden pandemic, fact-checking in the era of pseudoscience and misinformation. And I, myself, and Mary Rapine will be giving that talk, and we're going to be talking about how tensions are really high right now. There's definitely um, a lot of disagreement about facts versus fiction, and we'll be talking about scientific and information literacy and how important they're more important than ever. Um, we're going to talk about how you interpret science, verify expertise and authority, check our own emotions and biases in order to avoid the pitfalls of misinformation, especially regarding personal and public health issues. So we'll look forward to that. Um, so I'll hand it off to Rob. Well, thank you um, and welcome everyone for joining us this morning. Um, so a more perfect union diffusing disinformation. So basically we're having uncomfortable conversations um, and what we are doing today is going to be a lot different than a lot of your typical, um, you know, presentations or your typical um, uh, Zoom meetings that you've had over the years or over the last couple of years. We've been in a lot of them. Um, if you have been part of the Social Justice Forum, this is part of our, our focus is making sure that we are able to um, really pull out these conversations because I think in order for our world to move forward, we have to have these type of conversations. Today, our agenda will we'll go over a welcome, which I'll continue to do and we'll go over our ground rules. I'll show you a video, we'll have some breakout rooms. Um, we will you know, talk about various things in the workplace and we will have um, specific conversations. Our ground rules today, um, this is a safe space, but today I'm going to challenge us a little bit different. Um, it's not your typical safe space in the sense of um, we, I encourage participation. I encourage us to, um, when we do have the breakout rooms, you don't have to while I'm speaking in the main area, if you can participate um, by, um, by having your video on, or if you can participate by at least speaking, there might be ways because we, there's going to be some prompts that may need that. If not, that's okay. Uh, I just want um, to, again, in order for us to learn, through this, I want us to have um, as much opportunity as we can. Um, as we understand, we this can be very, very tough conversations. Um, we don't. Uh, we choose if you do have a question, um, put it into the chat. Private message me. Um, if you do want to make a question out um, out in the public, you can. But you got to be very conscious of time here, as we don't have much time. Um, as we don't have much time in this space that we don't want anyone dominating um, and dominating questions. If you have multiple questions, that's, there's no problem with that, but just be conscious of others that may want to ask questions as well. Um, in this space, you may hear some things that are uncomfortable and it may make you cringe. That is okay. This is why we're having these type of conversations. Um, it doesn't mean that we're here to argue and debate and do those type of things either. Uh, we're, we should all be having our professional caps on here and having an understanding of what it takes in order for us to move forward as a society. We've had many, uh, we've had many uh, information, lots of information out there about our, um, about race and culture, identity, um, where it comes from brutality, protesting, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. We've had all these various conversations over the last two years that can be very, very uncomfortable for a lot of us. And there's a lot of misinformation about these things. I'm not here to unpack all of those and debate about those. What I want us to understand and unpack today is the misinformation of ourselves and what, how we kind of maybe our biases may 
uh, project us in spaces that we may not realize that we are putting ourselves in. Here you have a quote here, learning how to have these conversations is a necessary art of moving forward as a healthy society. You can't fix what you can't talk about. And that's by Beverly Daniel Tatum, and the, which is the author, and why are all the black kids sitting together um, in the cafeteria? And other conversations about race that are, that are, that is, you know, that is prevalent in our world. Today, we will talk about these type of things, um, possibly, maybe. It all depends on how it goes. Um, this is not a scripted academia component of, uh, of misinformation, where I'm going to um, bore you with all the research and things that are out there, because I really want us to find a better sense of self and as we, as we go through this. So we'll have a little bit of that, but, it but we also have an opportunity to give ourselves, um, we have an opportunity to learn a little bit about ourselves and the people that are joining us today. Um, the people that are in this space might be individuals you know. They may be individuals you don't, do not know. It's a great opportunity to, to learn a little bit about, about each other. We have a couple of activities that, that I have that will help pull some of this information out and have us kind of really think about ourselves in, in these types of spaces. I will begin um, our sessions today. Um, again, uh, again, if you do, if you are not comfortable asking a question, you can private chat me the question and I can read it out to the, to the audience. Um, if you're okay with that, you can use a chat to kind of go back and forth if you choose uh, to do so. Um, if you uh, feel that you want to also impact this after, as we may get into some deep conversations here, please feel free to reach out to me and my department as we'll be able to help um, further this along. We will continue these conversations as well, as I will um, make mention at the end of this, at the end um, with our social justice forms, that this is part of that as well. So I will begin by starting us with a video and then we'll have an open discussion once the video is concluded, so. yourself why these are the black stories we've been shown a narrow view that limits our understanding but there's so much more to see Let's widen the screen so we can watch. So as we begin, and we'll start our discussions as we begin to uh, impact, unpack what we just witnessed, what were some of the first things that came to mind, good, bad, or indifferent, as you, let's take it in spaces. When you first started watching the video, how many of us thought something awful was going to happen? How many of us thought something positive was going to happen after watching the video in its first 10 seconds, 15 seconds? What were things that started coming to mind? What are things that you noticed? Visual, let's look at visuals while you're in the store. What did you notice? Look at cars, look at 
clothing. Let's look at, you know, looks. What are the things that we started noticing here? Anybody want to speak up? I'm just gonna unpack this for a few minutes. Just yep. that, just that that's the, what I see constantly on TV or, or you know, the, about the store, <clears throat> about the two young men in the store. Um, and it gave the impression that they were looking around to see if anybody was looking at them and the store owner <clears throat> was looking at them as if they were suspect. And yeah, so that was so delightful. It brought tears to my eyes, Rob, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. So, and that, and that right there is pretty powerful in itself, as you said, that they were looking around and then the store owner was looking around, right? So, and when we look at it in that space, now what's happening is that, does that particularly mean that they were, were they looking around because they were uncomfortable and, and knowing that they may be viewed in a, in a specific way, even though they may not should have been? Or did the, the owner started looking at them in a light that he saw at the end? Or was he looking at them as he was worried that this, these might be individuals who might look to steal um, or do something to his particular space or store, right? What are some of the, uh, and then, and it wasn't the case at the end, which was great. But those are some of the thoughts that came back and what you also said is very important. When you look at videos um, and you know CSI or FBI or whatever, you always see the, the, the kids who go into the store and, and they steal something, they run out the store and, and then the owner shoots at them accidentally and kills the kid and the kid only wanted food. And, but that's the way they start that video, right? We've all seen those type of things, right? And why is that? Why do they use that premise all the time? As if this is something that happens every moment and daily, and it really picks this picture of that dynamic, right? What are other thoughts that we had in, from this video today? Uh, the image of like the pregnant woman with uh, little kids, and uh, in immediately that kind of reinforced, it, uh, you know, in our media and, and the representation of like women of color, single mothers, black male are not, uh, men are not responsible fathers, that re reinforcing that stereotypical representation of black families. Uh, and that's what, you know, the first image is going to be like, you know, this woman who is actually struggling to, you know, with three kids and there is no, no one with her. Um, and um, so that's something that kind of like, you know, initially I, I that's what, that, that's the image I, I saw. And then I, I, exactly like, you know, brought tears in my eyes that, you know, that, you know, is loving family and this, it's kind of breaking that representation. Right. So now uh, that's a great, great um, picture. Right. So you're looking at the mom. She's there with her, her three children. She has the baby in her hand. But because she's a woman of color and then she's pregnant. Right. It almost looked that there is no father. You know, we've all like, again, I say we all because I've, I've never been pregnant. Right. But we all have seen people who go to the shopping mall and, and they forget their um, stroller or something, you know, just be, you know, just by moving around really fast that maybe the baby was walking and then the baby didn't want to walk later on. So you didn't put the baby in a stroller. And, but when you see it from the perspective of the woman of color, it's looking as there's no dad, there's, she's poor, she's struggling, right? And that was the first depiction that was shown. And then next thing you know, boom, like all of a sudden the father shows up, they have a nice car, he's kissing her, he loves his family. He grabs the baby to help and but that somehow our mind went to this other space right donnie i know you had a question yeah i think you could say the same thing with um the guy who's driving the car um you know there's like certain images that come to mind because of priming because of the media and news and things like that about certain car types certain looks certain clothes and then you know when he's pulling up to the house um you know there's like all of these biases that um you know, are kind of associated with, um, you know, men of color and, you know, again, clothing, what they drive and, you know, what, what you're supposed to, what, what you think is going to happen after. And, um, but it was, it was really um, beautiful to see like all of the positive representation and then 
in that specific scene, he walks in and he's like greeted by like, you know, a big um, loving family. So that was really nice to see. Yeah, absolutely. And so as you look at that, right, so there's this thing about swag, right? If you see me at work, you see me this particular way. So I'm okay. But I can't tell you how many times in my life that I've seen people I've worked with or I know when I come from the gym or I'm dressed outside of here that don't notice me, right? Or, and I think it's because it becomes protection mode. And I know I'm a big guy and I get that, right? But if all of a sudden I'm in a cutoff shirt and I have tattoos and I have a hat, you know, low, it's a different depiction. And what's happening there is I think sometimes we look at these, we look at the individual and you got the gold chain, he's leaning in his car, he has the, the IROC, um, um, I forgot how, again, I don't want to mess up the model of the car because I'm not a, a big car person, but he has that and it's lowered in it, there, right? he has the base going. And there's this, there's this assumption that there is, that this is something bad or this person is a, a particular way. And where does that come from, right? And where does that, where, where are those stereotypes coming from? Is it music videos? Is it, is it TV? Is it what we read about? Um, those, those type of images, you know, that these, these, that people picked as being bad where it's not, right? It's not because you know, look at Trayvon Martin wearing a hoodie. Remember, they were kept saying, well, he had a hoodie on and that means something bad. You know, my son wears a hoodie all the time. Like, it's just something that they do. And my son wouldn't hurt a fly. You know, it's just that thought process of how um, people depict certain garb or how people dress and how they, they appear at times. Carlos, you had something to add? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, just to piggyback on on the uh, what Donnie was saying, and you know, because I think uh, from from the news media, from uh, TV shows, from music video, like you said, you know, uh, the first thing that came to my mind <laughs> as a black man, you know, when I particularly the the guy in that nice car, the, uh, thinking about you know, those type of card, the image is like, here we go again, <laughs> right? It's like something, you know, they're gonna project something bad, right? It, 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 that's the, the image that we are fed on, right? Uh, on, on, on these images on, on the news. So it's, it's happy to see the, the, the change, the positive change nothing you know those those images are, are, are poured into our minds and we almost we become conditioned that we have to expect something bad to happen right so we have to change the narrative so uh and and, and show show that the, the positivity of of, of this uh, that those images can be transformed uh, uh on the other on, on the positive side so I just wanted to, to add that. But, you know, we, we become almost like um, we, we, we see these images and the, the reinforcement of so be, being so prevalent of the negative side, you know, we, we all, always almost unconsciously assume that, you know, it, it must be those people must be bad, right? So, and and, uh, and it, it's not. So uh, we we have to we we have to switch the chip, if you will, okay, and and not see uh, uh, those images as negative, okay? like the the end of the video that shows. Thank no, you. absolutely. No, absolutely. That perspective is valuable, right? And how do you change the chip, right? And how do you change that perspective? And how do, and I think these are, these conversations and the, these spaces will allow for those things to happen. So us as individuals within these spaces can start to have a better understanding and grow, right? Because we all have tons of growth. A couple of things that were in the chat, we have, they also focus the scene on focusing on a bus stop to make us assume that, um, as she was uh, walking to the bus stop, absolutely. I thought the mother and children were at a motel reinforcing the intersection between race and poverty, absolutely. So those scenes are done very, designed that particular way because they want to see what comes to mind 
as we are as we are you know processing um, the information. Those images worked as cultural shorthand to describe any of these early scenes. We can um, we all can play out the rest of the scene how um, it would um, how it how it would resolve stereotypically. Okay, absolutely. I have also here. I wish. Um, there were um, same clip, and so this is private. Um, some same clips that were um, white and other racial ethnic actors, so we could test our visceral reaction to those and see how they were the same, um, if they were the same. Also, wonder if the visceral reaction of black and other minority groups was um, was to the clips, right? Absolutely, and I think that is also a perspective that we will. Um, hopefully unpack a little bit today as well as we start to, um, it, you know, really investigate this. And that's one thing I want us to all understand is as we're looking at this, our end goal um, as we are as an institution is looking for success of students who, just so people understand, one of our primary goals at Bristol and through the state of Massachusetts is the success of Black and Latinx Latino male um, students. And they have been not retained at very, very high rates um, at, 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 at higher ed institutions and um, throughout the country um, and throughout our state, as well as, um, you know, you look at, there's other demographics as well. Um, so some of the things and the reason why that video was, was chosen is because it really hits, it really hits the, the nail on some of the, the stereotypes that we may have on some of our students, you know, um, you know, and I think those are some of those those pieces that we kind of really look at. And I have here more so than females. Yeah, I mean, so females are absolutely part of this um, the discussion as well. But the one thing is, you know, when you look at higher higher ed, I'm just talking about from that scope is one of those focuses because you're looking at the lower retention rates for those groups. And and I think and there's a reason. I think those those groups where you're men of color they do come into spaces with a bias that people look at. And I think one of those things is we don't understand the strengths of these populations. And we're really trying to develop and, this, and, and, and on professional day coming this week, we'll talk a little bit about that. And so stay tuned for that. But one of those things is kind of looking at that we don't look at things from a deficit mindset. We look at things a little bit differently. So that's why I've kind of brought that up a little bit. All right. So, uh, we're gonna go into the next phase here um, as we unpack it. And thanks for the candid uh, question, you know, questions and, 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 and remarks, uh, very appreciative. I'm gonna have us go and do something a little different and we're gonna go into breakout rooms. And this is what I call us, this is my library section. And I wanna consider us all a book and we're going to be checked out, but there's gonna be, we're gonna have a, a part of this where we're in silence and a part of this where we will be able to discuss with one another. So when you get to your breakout rooms, you're going to, you're going to go into a room and you might be paired up with two, three, possibly four individuals, depending on how the algorithm of how many people are in here is. Once you get into this breakout room, you're going to jot down the first things that come to mind about your breakout room partners, even if you know them. The 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 catch here is for the first two minutes, no one's able to speak. I want you to, if you know their position and you know them a little bit, and that's a little unfair, but then I want you to kind of think about other things you may not know about them. Think about anything, whatever comes to mind, okay? Personal, physical, career, uh, whatever it is, student, non-student, whatever it is that comes to mind, I want you to jot it down. For about two minutes and now i want you to break it down if there's three people for each person and don't say a word to one another it's going to be an awkward stare it's going to be awkward you're going to it's not going to feel comfortable at all okay then i want you to introduce each other hi i'm i'm rob delalu i'm blah blah, blah blah i'm from blah, blah 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 and i want you to introduce yourself a little bit whether that's your, and however you feel like introducing yourself. I'm not gonna force you into how you introduce yourself. Once you do that, then I want you guys to share. I want everyone here to share some of the things that they have and try to be comfortable with it and be blunt and honest about what it is 
And then I want you to, as the person who, when you're hearing about yourself, to be able to say, no, well, this is who I am. And you're revealing it. And I want us to have that dialogue. Then we'll come back. Okay. So it will be, you know, so first two minutes of silence. The next two minutes is introduction. Then the next six to seven minutes is going to be um, unpacking what we, what, we, what we thought. And then we are going to then retort that. And then we're going to come back into the space and we're going to share out, we won't say who and what, but what we learn in that time. Okay. And then we'll get ourselves uh, back. Okay. So again, if you can, if you have an ability to, I know some people might um, be working and they're just listening. That's absolutely fine. You don't have, you're not forced to participate, but if you really can and really want to step out your comfort zone, please try this activity. Um, and we will break out right now. I think everybody's stuff. So that's a good thing. Hopefully we're able not to take everything too, too serious, um, but serious at the, at the same time. Um, and we're able to share out. Um, you know, I can imagine how interesting um, all of it may have been um, to be uncomfortable. I call this my, um, I call this my library session. Um, and I, I do that sometimes with students um, in the center. Um, and what it is, is basically we are, um, we're checking each other out, not visually in a sense of, we're, it's basically looking at a book at its cover and then, and then trying to unpack without reading the cover. We just look at a book and see if we're interested in what we think about this particular book. Um, and sometimes we do that, right? We go to a bookshelf and we just pick out a book and we don't even know what it looks like, but it, it, it captured us um, or we had a certain thought about it. So as that all happened and unpacked, we, we have a few minutes here um, to really talk about what we're, how, we'll go in sections. So um, if anybody was like to share out, we don't have to use names or anything, but things that we've learned, things that we saw, things that we saw interesting, um, things that jumped out at us, things that we didn't know, things that you might've found out, right? We're, we're self-reflecting here. What did we find out about ourselves um, in, that, in these moments here that we had the conversation? Um, so feel free to ask a question. Um, raise your hand, I, or if you want to send a private message to me, I can read it out as well. Um, but I'd love to hear how what happened during this time. Yes, Joanna. Um, so I'll just share that um, if I look at my observations, I the one observation I made was in regards to someone's ethnicity because of her size and coloring and hair and looks. So that's a uh, assumption. And then I made another assumption about another participant um, because she had the Bristol background behind her. So I assumed she was very hardworking. Mm. And I'm not because I don't have it behind me. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> All right. So we looked at it. We looked at culture and you also looked at um, you also looked at professionalism or um, technical the, the technical components of it. As So those are some things that you um, mm -hmm. Saw yeah. absolutely. Others, thoughts, observations. Yes, JP. Uh, I think in in my group we talked about um, one thing that came up with each of us was how we were situated uh, relative to everybody else, how we were different, whether it was uh, gender uh, uh, for Amanda, or we noticed all of us had glasses except one person. Um, and age and things like that. Okay. Other thoughts of unpacking what what do we think in there? How did our first how did our assumptions vary from um, the unpacking of who we were our, our rel when we revealed ourselves to one another? Was our assumptions accurate? Were they inaccurate? Uh, yes, Crystal. So I'll just say that um, it was uncomfortable sitting in silence. Like I, I knew it was going to be uncomfortable, but I didn't realize how uncomfortable it was until we actually did it. Um, so that was interesting. And then I thought about what it might be like doing that same activity in person and how much more uncomfortable that would feel. Yeah. Um, so kudos to you for level of, of discomfort there. But in terms of like the assumptions that were made, I think for my group, we were generally like on par. Like it, I, I don't know, the things that I thought of my group members ended up being pretty true. And then I was interested, it was interesting to hear back 
what folks were thinking, I got a little nervous. Um, but then hearing it back, it was like, oh, okay, like that's like, thank goodness. So, I don't know. I, I've never actually asked a colleague or, you know, walked up to someone on campus and asked what their initial perception of me may be or what assumptions they do make. So I thought it was an interesting activity. So, yeah. And what I love this um, to doing this with our students and why I love this particular activity is when you're in silence, it's just like that video, the first 30 seconds is silence. They're, they, they're not with their other person. Their friend didn't walk in the room. The husband didn't, didn't pick, pick someone up, right? The, they didn't get to the family home. They were just in silence by themselves. And so that's what I wanted us to do. And imagine a student when they walk into a room and they don't know anyone. And that's that first awkwardness. They don't know how to say hello. They don't, they, they don't, they don't know what people are thinking of them. And that's what kind of I wanted us to say. Like, what are people thinking of me right now? Right, because that happens with our students at times, right? Uh, yes, Laura. Thanks, Rob. Building on that, one of the people in our group, um, uh, a black person said, one of her thoughts was, I wonder if these two white folks in my group have friends who look like me. Mm. And I thought, I, I was just really struck by that question. And I, in circles, like when I grew up in, in church, uh, like camping, um, uh, I had, had a, a, a Black friend when I was growing up. She was just part of the group that we, we did things with. I work with, obviously, um, you know, folks of all ethnicities. In terms of the church that I'm in and in my circles, there aren't black folks, you know? And so that's caused me to, to think about um, the environment that I'm in and um, trying to have a little more empathy, I think, for how questions folks may have of me trying to get to know me. So it, it was challenging. It was. It was uh, helpful, um, provocative. And I love that. And I love the authenticity, uh, how authentic you were in that, in that space because we need that, right? And then as you're unpacking and, and thinking, well, well, why did this person state that? Like, and again, it's not a personal attack on you as an individual, but this is, these are questions that sometimes our individual color will face, especially when they walk into a room and they walk into a situation where everyone does not look like them, right? And now you're, they're stating there like, how does this person take me? Where did this person come from? Um, my son experiences that now, like he's now at Wentworth Institute of Technology and all of his friends are, they're not, as he called it, they're not New Bedford white. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? He's like, well, I'm in an institute that the people in New Bedford are used to, they, they understand diversity more so than, and although there, there still might be biases, as he said, the individuals I'm working, uh, I'm in school with now are from areas where they may have had one black person in their school, right? And so now it's this whole different, you know, environment that, that he's in. And I think sometimes we don't understand that those are questions that individuals might be thinking. Meanwhile, you're going about your business and you have you're not thinking about that because you don't have to. And that, this will lead us into our second part um, of our, our, our next video, but it will, but these are things that happen. And although it's not done with any type of, on your part, it just sometimes, this is something that you're just not, you're not aware of because you're just going about your business. But sometimes that student is sitting there and they're going through that, in that, that or that person, your colleague even. You know, when we sit in a space like this, we could look and see many colleagues of color in a space like this. However, most of your colleagues, are, we are not all in the same department. We're one of one in our spaces, right? And so that's sometimes, those are things that we have to think about. And now we're, we're projecting a specific way because we are like, we're not sure how people will take who we are um, in those spaces, where they take us serious, or they take us not. And although that might be silly to think, that's a, that's a truth that individuals will, will deal with while they're in those spaces. So thank you for your, your honesty there. We have some assumptions we're more accurate 
like they were a student at BCC or professional staff um, through our perceptions may have been different if they were more public, um, a more public forum where we didn't know everyone here somehow um, associated with um, BCC. All right, so again, that is, you know, um, real as well. Um, I think when you get into those other spaces and I do, you know, have this exercise in, in spaces where we consult and people don't know each other, um, maybe it, it will show, it, it would be really different. At least we have, we have an unfair advantage. So that's why I'm like, no, oh, this might be okay to run it here, um, but we kind of go from there. Um, I have one more time for one more, if anybody wanted to share anything. Any volunteers going once, going twice? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, uh, so we did have uh, one black woman in our group and um, us two both noticed her hair right away. And then I had in my head like, a, oh, okay, we're fascinated with black women's hair thing um, and how much that is a stereotype and how much it's probably contextually okay to have interest, but like knowing boundaries around touching and all that kind of thing. And um, yeah, just uh, yeah. just kind of watching and judging myself a little bit while yeah. also understanding like it's natural to notice someone's hair because it's like the closest thing to the rest of their face. Mm. And absolutely, and I think those are one of those things that we don't recognize sometimes in our spaces, right? So if a black woman changes their hair um, or have it in a particular way, um, they will get specific looks or they may in that space to say, hey, like your hair looks pretty today sometimes, right? Because now they have the hair straight and before they didn't have the hair straight, these are real things that happen that individuals don't even recognize. Like, why didn't you make mention of their hair being beautiful when they had it um, braided or when they had it in a particular bun or whatever the case may be, but once they did. Now, again, has nothing that you're just being honest and you're, you're trying to give a compliment, but not realizing and understanding where that person may come from. And this is where sometimes these, these uncomfortable things happen and the misinformation um, comes out from it. And that's why I had that this little discussion to see where that misinformation would come from and how we would kind of self-reflect in that space. So we'll show you this next video as we unpack as we unpack that a lot of things that we just mentioned because all of those feelings that you have and I'm pretty sure a lot of us didn't raise our hand and volunteer which is absolutely fine. I'm pretty sure that this next video will probably have um, a lot of information that and some of you may have seen this that was just spoken upon in some of our um, our thoughts during our conversation. So go ahead. Thanks, Melissa. Hey, Jen, I really like your hair. Thanks, Becky. I think the curls are awesome. Black hair's the best. Ah! Can you not do that? It's kind of inappropriate. What? Why? Well, it's kind of racist. You're probably wondering, what went wrong in this workplace interaction between Becky and Jen? Unless you have a keen understanding of racial discrimination in today's workforce, you probably didn't notice that something very offensive has taken place. Jen called Becky the R word, causing Becky to feel shame and sadness. How can we avoid situations like this? Workplace discrimination is a very serious issue, and we have to be sensitive to our employees' different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. And just as it's important to be sensitive to our black, Arab, and other non-white co-workers, it's also equally important to be sensitive to our white co-workers' sensitivity to that sensitivity. Can you believe that Trump wants to build a wall? I mean, I must really bother you as a Mexican. Actually, I am Bolivian. How dare you? I went to Berkeley. Berkeley. Sometimes racial discrimination in the workplace can happen unintentionally. Take for instance this scene where Marco accidentally angered Tom by correcting him. Marco may not be Mexican, but correcting Tom in that manner made Tom confused, scared, and hostile. This situation could have been avoided altogether. Let's see how. Can you believe Trump wants to build a wall? I mean, that must really bother you as a Mexican. Um, yeah. I love Mexicans. They're so hardworking. Yeah, they, I mean, yes, we are, we are great. Viva la Mexico! <laughs> Go! 
crisis averted. Every day we learn more about how people of color live with histories of oppression. And every day we forget about those who also live with those histories, the oppressors. You see, the average person of color has spent years developing a thick skin when it comes to systemic racial oppression, while the average white person can go through many of their formative years without ever having to think about race. So hearing about racism can be traumatic for your white coworkers and create a negative work environment. White privilege might seem like everything is easier all the time, and it is, but it can also be hard because feelings are hard. Yes, I just got the raise, 30 bucks an hour. Let's celebrate after work. That's great, 30 bucks. Congratulations, oh my God. Denise just got a raise and told Jane about it in celebration. But what Denise doesn't know is Jane is actually earning far more for the same job, and now she feels guilty about it. If Denise had just kept her new income to herself, this whole situation could have been avoided. Yes, I just got the raise. Let's celebrate after work. Drinks are on you. Of course. <laughs> Being sensitive to white fragility is difficult, which is why we've devised a simple system to help you foster a non-hostile work environment for your white employees and coworkers. Stop, ignore, listen, empathize, never complain, and eat. Or as we like to call it, the silence system. Here. Let's watch what happens when silence is put into action. So I'm not racist. Stop. Like, I voted for Obama. Ignore. Like, I understand the reason for the Black Lives Matter movement. Listen. But it's just like, all lives do matter. Empathize. I just feel like race really isn't relevant in America anymore. Never complain. You're really easy to talk to, Adrian. And eat. That's right. Excellent. Adrian was able to diffuse a potentially hostile work situation by using silence. Great work, Adrian. America is a beautiful country built on some ugly things. Things that just don't belong in the workplace. And in order to remain productive, we must all pitch in to protect our most powerful and most fragile. Because when silence works, everyone works. So let's all be sensitive. White sensitive. Hey. All right. So this video is is covers a lot and it's really deep. Now, my people who are white, this is not an attack on you and, and your whiteness. This is an absolute <laughs> opportunity to talk about <laughs> uncomfortable conversations and misinformation and all those things, right? And I know that that might be that thought process. But why this video is really important and is because we all have privilege and privileges. And this is where we move into our next, our next section for those that are able to attend. And what I wanted to do, and, and as we kind of look at this and as we unpack all of this, is really take a look at that video for a second and think about those type of things that happen. And sometimes we don't understand. And as you can see, things happen unintentionally at times. And we just have to be a little bit conscious of this, you know what I mean? Um, you know, and then I think that that's one of those, one of those spaces that we kind of operate. So it's a very provocative video. It's supposed to be funny, but I'm pretty sure some people laugh at it because they can take, take it as understanding and learning and others might take it a little bit more serious. Like, wow, like I feel attacked here. Um, and I get that, right? And that's why we have these spaces in order to do that professionally and have the opportunity um, and have an opportunity to do that. So uh, any quick, before we, we move into, we move on for this and we do my the little exercise, any quick thoughts about what we just witnessed? Yes. yes Why did they call silence, silence? <laughs> I was so confused. I was all like, oh, silence, okay. And I was all like, did she just say silence? Yeah. I it's just a, never. It's, it's, it's just a play on it's just a play on the word as it like this is something new like it's a new term and then this is how and, this, and it's like a new you know it's like a new acronym or whatever and that's how it was and then they had the different meanings to to it so it wasn't anything 
intentional with just kind of just being a little silly. Um, as yeah, were. I could totally see that. <laughs> but I, I was just like, weird. I kind of viewed it as it was actually intentional because saying to be silent about it would be wrong. Yes. But being silent about it oh, can be right. That's a good point, Joseph. You're right. <laughs> that makes sense now. I was just a little uh, confused as to. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. No, that and I think that's where they were going because you know we all understand. And then here's the other piece, right? A lot of times, us as individuals, we stay silent, um, and that's why we can't have uncomfortable conversations because we don't want people to feel uncomfortable. And so, when looking at it in the sense that we can really look at each other and have these open discussions that are a little bit more um, prevalent, and that we have the space that we can share um, and and be a little bit more vocal. Um, and not be silent because um, a lot of times we 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 associate um, sometimes we associate these things and we say well you're silent so your your signs are showing where you stand and that might not necessarily be the truth right so I think and then sometimes we stay silent because we don't want to um, as a person of color I'll stay silent so a white person might stay silent because they just don't want that uncomfortable conversation a person of color might stay silent just because well, this person keeps announcing my last name wrong or my name wrong. And I just stay silent because whatever, it's not even that big of a deal. Meaning, but you're losing your identity and uh, they're stating other names correctly. So how do you, so how do those things happen? So those are pieces that you want to kind of look at, you know? So again, um, you know, you know, you know, so those are the type of things. So I do have um, a comment here too. I'm tired of the assumption that because I am white, that I am bigoted and racist. And, and I get that, right? So sometimes, we are wrongfully, um, we are wrongfully accused because we are not, and we're learning, right? L life is a learning curve, and we're as we are learning. So that might not be true, um, and you may not feel that. But sometimes things that we do might also come from a space that we don't realize that might sound bigoted. So I think that's where the self-reflection piece comes into place and learning more and more about ourselves and and hearing those things. And it's hard to hear that, right? So that lady did touch her hair and that lady said, well, that's kind of racist like to, to do that. And, and then although you might say, well, why is, how is that racist to so that? You know, it may came, it may come off a particular way when that wasn't the intention. And sometimes people will assume um, who we are and say something. And I think that's a time where we can have, we can diffuse that misinformation about ourselves. So again, we talk about misinformation, part of that misinformation um, being a person, a, a white person, Sometimes that is you saying, no, I'm not. I might have done this wrong. I apologize, but that's not who I am or how I feel. Going into the defense and, and, and arguing back and forth probably won't get it resolved, but maybe looking at ways that we can communicate a little differently. Um, go ahead, uh, Amy. And I was just thinking like the video is all like fun and like the irony and all of that, like the silence and stuff. But then if we think about like as white folks, how much that black or like BIPOC folks are just silenced daily. Um, Cause like that little image with all of the like kind of dots dropping down, it's like, that's the privilege piece. And like you started talking about it a little bit, Rob, but like, yeah, sometimes you're like, I'm not gonna have this conversation because just waking up in the morning as a person of color, how many interactions with white folks or just people in the world that you have to just stay silent to like protect your own peace as a person of color. And so as white folks kind of like thinking like, that's where I have my privilege. I can get up, go to work, be in this situation, excuse me, be in this situation and then not have to worry about say my peace being um, disturbed, if you may. Absolutely. And I think, you know, life has, has taught us many, many of these different ways and you're right, right? So, you know, as you go into spaces, you may not have to think about that. I look at gender at, at times, depending on where you are as far as your professional um, growth is. And then women have to sometimes have to act a specific certain way and because they need to show that they are leaders and they can be a particular way. Person of color is the same thing. Not only that, I have to show those things that I can be a leader, but also have to say, well, how do I intermix? Like individuals may not understand the things that I like or do, or I have to be very conscious of how I state things or how I am. Um, there's, you know, a lot of us, I don't know if you heard about code switching, but that is a real thing that many of us, um, of people of color have to do in spaces. And although our white counterparts may not think we have to, we feel that, well, how do I get to where I need to be professionally? 
um, if I'm not able to um, acclimate myself to an environment that really wasn't built for me. And that's the same thing with our students. How do they acclimate to an environment that really wasn't built for them? And this is why um, we do the things that we do and, and as we are um, in that space as well. I have, um, I'm, I know that we're, we're running short on time here as, we're, as we're, we're closing up. And this is very, very important. And what I'm gonna do is we, we're gonna shorten it real quick. And we're gonna talk about our particular privilege and where we are in space, right? So it says 15 minutes here, we're not doing that. We're really gonna do it um, four or five minutes at tops, just so we can come back and, and finish up um, on time. But what I wanted to do is think, take about the video, but also understand privilege is not just a white thing. And I think sometimes we get very discouraged when we hear the word white privilege. And unfortunately, we people do get discouraged, especially our, 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 our our white friends and counters, you know, our counterparts, our colleagues get really defensive when they hear that. And I understand why, right? Because it's not something to easily swallow, right? Because I'm like, I'm not privileged. I work hard. I do the things I need to do. Like I didn't grow up. I grew up poor. I worked hard as heck for the things that I have. But sometimes we don't recognize um, the privileges we have. Now, myself as a black man, I have many privileges as well. Um, as being a black man in certain in certain scenarios and situations and, and spaces that I have a privilege with, right? I do have privilege, to, uh, a specific privilege immediately when I speak to other black males on campus, right? They do they do become a little bit more acclimated to me because of the identity that I that I share. I'm being being a man. I have many privileges in this world that our women do not um, pr um, have the privilege of right of being a man in spaces and, and, and certain things. So we all have our different spaces, whether we are a white woman, a white male, like if we depend, you know, if we, he, she, or they, no matter where we are in our spaces, we all who are identities, we have specific privileges. And I want us to kind of break up real quick and just talk about those things, unpack those. What are the privileges you have? Not what the other people have, but what are the privileges you have? And then I want, and then, and then as we can, as we chime in on that, the second piece about it is say, well, did you think, maybe say one thing that you think the other person has a privilege on that maybe they may not have mentioned, if you can. If not, then that's okay. And again, this is uncomfortable. This is misinformation, but this is an opportunity to kind of do that to help us move forward. So we're going to do that just for a couple of minutes here, and then we'll come back. We'll, we'll unpack that real, and then I'll give you the next action items, some good resources to read will break up and then this will be continued in our next part of our social justice forums um, later to be announced in a later date. Um, so thank you for those who are standing around. I know um, it, we do have a segment for an hour and a half, so that's why it's an hour and a half session. But I know a lot of us have you know, 12 o'clock meetings and those that can hang around, I appreciate it um, as we are recapping. Um, that particular space was done on, on purpose for several reasons. A, we wanted to unpack our privileges. Um, we've always, always heard about white privilege, but I want us to talk about other various privileges because I wanted our people that are white to speak about their privileges that they may or may not have realized. But I also want people of color and people of different races and ethnicities and gender and to speak about their privileges and things that they have as well to recognize that um, as it's okay to understand our privileges and things that we have, advantages that we may have um, in this world as well, right? And to kind of unpack that. So as we were in those spaces and we did con um, converse back and forth, what are some of the things that we, you know, we won't spend too much time on this, but uh, what are some of the things that we um, recognize and found in, in, in these spaces? Again, we can keep it private. You can send me in a private chat. Um, you can also, you know, speak outwardly about things that you've discovered about yourself, things that you heard about others that you didn't recognize and realize. We don't have to use names. Uh, but we just want to kind of just unpack this a little bit. I'm healthy. Oh, go ahead, uh, Nancy. I was just saying that youth and strength seem to have privilege and education. Mm -hmm. youth, youth, strength, and education. Youth, strength, and education. Absolutely. Amanda? I'm healthy. You're happy? Healthy. I'm oh, healthy. healthy. Well, I'm happy. <laughs> yes, I'm very happy. <laughs> but I'm healthy. You know, like... Yes. Um, that's a privilege. I don't have absolutely. any real debilitating, you know, things. Mm, absolutely. Others. Rob, um, yes. I can share. So 
I was telling my group, Amy and Amanda were in my group, and I was telling them that after reading um, White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with that, it really made me think about the privilege that I have, even as a Black person, you know, somebody who's highly educated, someone that has a doctorate, someone that's a dean, you know, someone that's a heterosexual, someone that lives in a, you know, an upper middle class um, neighborhood, you know, all these things. Um, I have privilege with, but it also means that my privilege only extends so far based on the groups that I'm in, right? So if I'm in a, a, a highly educated group or a less educated group, then, you know, my privilege, I my privilege could be seen a certain way based on, on the, um, the groups that I, I'm in at that present moment. Mm, love that. And I, understanding your privileges is something that, you know, is very it, 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 it's, just, it's a weird space, right? Because even as people of color, highly educated and, and, very, and doing well for yourself, um, you'll go back into spaces where you have family, friends, um, loved ones, you know, that you grew up with that are not in that space. And then now you're, you don't, re you start recognizing your own privilege as you're in that, in those environments. And, um, and then when you are in environments where you're not with those individuals, then you, you go from almost being you know, in a sense, uh, I'll use it and, you know, you go from being almost the, the leader in some spaces and in other spaces you go and you're, you're like, well, I don't even know where I fit, right? And am I a leader? Or am I not? And, and it's, it's very, it's a, it's a fine line that we navigate at times. Um, I witness it a lot um, in, in my daily, my day-to-day -day life. Um, others. Come on. Rob, I can um, yeah. jump in here. So my group talked about um, like education came up, but as we we're talking about that piece, it kind of made me think about, like I know that um, in a lot of ways, um, code switching is a, a defense mechanism, if you will, right? A way to, to get by. But I feel like at times it almost is our privilege, like to be able to adapt to, a different space and I like I, I almost see that as a privilege that I have whereas I think previously I always thought of it as just like something to to protect my space to protect myself but I do feel like because there are other folks of color who are not able to code switch and I think that you it is what it is in those circumstances so I, I would actually highlight that as being for some people um, yeah. a privilege. You know, I've never thought of it in that way. Well, and now by you say, stating that, I might think of a whole nother form to have that can really talk about that and unpack it. Because I think that could be very interesting, right? Because are we being to, able to do that? What does that do to our identity? But then, you know, is it the person who states one particular way and does not want to change to fit in? Is that person necessarily wrong? Is the person who's code switching, is that the right way? So I get that what you're stating and I love it because I think that really, that just made my mind go like, right? cause now I'm thinking of all types of things that can um, be brought from that, um, from that. So thank you for, for sharing that. And I, that's absolutely a different way of, of thinking about it. And I appreciate it. I do have a hand up, but I don't see it on my, I see it on the bright left corner, but I don't see it on the screens here. So if you do have, oh, go ahead, there it is, because it's that yellow on yellow there. Uh, go ahead, Travis. Um, mine was uh, that even though uh, I'm a big person and uh, I occasionally wear a hoodie, uh, I, if uh, I'm ever in a situation where there's police involved, I don't have that first thing in my head that I'm going to end up on the ground with a knee to the back of my neck. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I like that um, and I have that understanding, right? So that, that's something that we hadn't really, again, we can go in many different directions, but speaking about various privileges, right? So um, I don't know if many of us who don't have a Black son, I have a Black son, um, and if you don't, that's, uh, I understand why you wouldn't think this way, but me, uh, specifically through my traumas, I teach my son, hey, if you're driving, you have your camera, here's where your license and registration needs to be. Here's all these different steps that I mentioned because of the fear that I have of them because of when I was young, 
I was held at gunpoint twice by police officers. My neck was stepped on the back of as, as I was, it was younger, right? And if I move the wrong way, maybe no one knows who I am today. As something happens, maybe the, you know, and the description was a six foot black male, right? So what does that mean, right? And that's what they told me at the time in both, both instances. And then as an adult, I was questioned because I have three vehicles registered in my name. You know, why do you have three visit vehicles registered in your name? Like, why not? I mean, people do, no? You know, and so these are the things that resonate in your mind. And then you teach, I teach my son and like, you're right. So you might be a big male like I am. And then you have a hoodie on. Sometimes I have a hat or I wear a scully. Um, if you don't know a scully, it's like a beanie, like a, a, a winter hat, right? And so those are things that we have that we do and then we get judged based off of it, right? And then we get those, we get those prompting questions from authorities that can easily turn us to be frustrated. And I see why people are frustrated. Like, why are you asking me these questions? What are you, what are you getting at? Um, and those are things where there's a misinformation from the police departments of understanding of, um, you know, I think yesterday there was something that Sean King had, a, a woman had a gun um, pointed to her back by police officers, and then they they mis, were misinformed about the individual. They took everything back, but as they took it back, they said, hey, this is a learning experience. So as they're learning, but she's stating, this is my life, like, I, you don't understand a learning experience. I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. And you're talking about education here. Like these are things that we don't really recognize and have those conversations um, a lot. So those are stuff that, so I appreciate that honesty there um, with, the, with, with that thought of privilege because we don't recognize and see those type of things. And then, and although some people say that's silly, you shouldn't have to have that conversation. It's a real life thing. I mean, through my trauma, every time I see police brutality, I, re, I go back to when I was 14, 15 years old and being treated like I was a criminal or a grown man and being thrown to the ground by, by, you know, felt like 20 police officers, right? It was that, and at that time. So it's just those are the type of things that, you, and I was at a, a school dance, literally when I, you know, I was at a school dance and then the people had to come out and say, wait, what's going on here? It was just inside. He just went to the store. Like, you know what I mean? So it just, those type of things happen and you don't recognize it and, those traumas do come back to individuals who have been through it. And then sometimes traumas also, even if you haven't been through it by seeing it visually, and when you see it, it's your people or your alike, people who look alike as you, you kind of sympathize and see those, those, those things and you kind of live those experiences and you should be aware of those things because we should not be naive that it could not happen to us um, in those spaces, regardless of privilege, um, regardless of how much money we make, regardless of where we live, um, you have to be very aware of those things. So I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate this conversation that we've, we've had today and we can continue to go. I have so much material on this stuff and so many activities. And this is where our social justice forms really turn from and miss and hearing and reflecting type of, not hearing, it's more of a educating ourselves on these matters. Now we're gonna kind of move into action-based stuff where we're gonna have opportunities where we do workshops like this, where we're able to get into breakout rooms, talk a little bit and not have your, your typical sit down, listen about what we should do as far as DEI work, race and education and, look, and thinking about what we should do with, you know, I get that and it's necessary and it's needed, but a lot of our forms will be really interactive based where we're able to kind of unpack some things as we go through it. Um, as we always have, we have resources for you that are, that are, that are presented. Um, our particular resources that um, where our next step and actual items is I have here, so I can't do something. And sometimes we think our spaces are too small um, to impact anything. And we think more grand, grandular and we think it in a, a bigger space. And I want you to think about how do you influence your own circle? That's all that matters. That's how this world changes. It doesn't change by you doing something incredible on the outside or creating something. It's just changing your own circle. And your own circle could be your family, your friends. Um, it could be yourself. Um, it could be you know specific loved ones. It could be your students. Um, it could be your staff members, right? It could be in all those spaces. It could be your colleague. It could be your, your friend who you study with um, if you're a student. So these are all spaces where we're able to have conversations and try to make yourself I understand it's uncomfortable, but try it a little bit. Try to make yourself a little bit uncomfortable and have those conversations with people that we might have at a dinner table that might think differently than us. 
And it's okay to challenge that. I'm learning in life right now that you have to be able to, if you love people, you have to be able to state your, yourself to not stay silent because you love them. Stay, be vocal because you love them, right? And that, and these are opportunities where you can help yourselves and others out. Some of the um, items that we do have for you that, to take a look at are books, right? And these are some of the books that are out where we look at our identity and really have an understanding of what that may be and, and putting yourself in different space. Even if you identify with the culture or don't identify with the culture, these are always good reads for you, no matter your race, color, gender, um, it's an, a great opportunity to read. So Right Fragility is something that is out by um, Robin DiAngelo. So you wanna talk about race, is, is a great book. You want Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man with Emmanuel Acho that is out. And Dear White Woman, Please Come Home, um, and, which is basically Hemi of Biases. And I'll show you your connection by Kimberly Yolanda Williams. These are some good reads. There's many other good reads. And if you do subscribe to our um, social justice forum um, uh, newsletter, you'll have this and many others that we have in our toolboxes in order to help you out. Now, talking about influencing our circles, if you have young children that you're wondering, how do I introduce this to young children, my grandchildren, students I teach, um, um, you know, family members, just in general, how do I educate on race? There are a few here, um, all are welcome, right, is, is a great one. You look at the day you begin, uncomfortable conversations with a black boy. Again, this is with Emmanuel Acho. And then so those are very, very important um, little reads that can really help um, bring out some information for uh, your um, for your your young ones as well. Um, as always, you know, subscribe to the social justice newsletter. Um, utilize your, uh, our toolboxes that we have. If you do subscribe, all of our last our our, our forms that are very similar to this will be part of that. Um, and then also join us in our upcoming. Stay tuned on that for our upcoming. Um, we have a couple that are planned. Just don't know the exact dates of when we're going to launch them, but they should be coming out soon. So again, I want to thank everyone for this. If you do want to unpack this more, come find us at the at the Multicultural Student Center. Um, if send me an email if you want to kind of have a meeting and talk about these things, um, you know. And I understand that we can put ourselves in position um, to do uh, much better um, as we move along. And uh, Joanna, yes. Um, thanks for this, Rob. And I just want to ask, how do you subscribe? Like, how do we how do we do that? Yeah, so if you subscribe to the newsletter, Melissa has a link um, that we'll send out to everyone that was here. I don't know, she might put it in the chat if she has enough time. If not, she'll send out an email if you haven't subscribed. Usually when you sign up for any of our stuff, it, there's a link usually attached to sign up to the social justice okay. newsletter. Thank and you. you can also, you also can do it on our multicultural affairs page. There's a link there to subscribe to our newsletter as well. Okay. Um, but Thanks, we will Rob. send out, we will send out an email. Great, thank you. All right. All Excellent right. well, thank job. You. Thank you. And thanks everyone for, for being here today and have yourself a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye.